All right, Alan, are you happy? We're recording now. No, I'm okay. not. You should have been recording 10 minutes ago. I think we should be going. Of course, what, did we, what are we talking about today again? We, well, right now we're talking about mascots at the Braves game. Those are fun. They are the fun. mascots. I know. And our guests in here are indulging us with stories about how people can get hammered, get wrenched, and screwed. And screwed. Great. So <laughs> listen to this podcast because you can never, you could always get hammered, wrenched, or screwed. I think that's the uh, purpose of this one. Or that <laughs> we've got a lot of taglines. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get this sucker going. I am excited about this one, and I can't even tell you guys. I got hair standing on my arms. I'm so excited about this episode. That's how excited I am. So we start every episode with cheers. 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 Cheers, cheers. guys. What? We have two extra people in here. Usually we only have one. We have graduated to having two. This is amazing. I'm I'm so stoked because I have Ken Cornwall and KJ Cornwall in here from Provence Systems. They've been longtime friends of mine, uh, and I've been able to watch their business. I would like to say the word grow, but I don't even know how big it is now because they were big when I met them, and they're just even bigger now. <laughs> but uh, what I'm excited about here is that for the first time in our show's history, we have somebody with 65 years of business experience working for himself, and that's Ken Cornwall. But I can't do him justice by introducing him. I'm going to let him just tell us a little bit about who he is and where he's from. So, Ken, welcome. Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from? Well, thank you. Good to be here. Uh, I guess I started out uh, way back uh, when I became a uh, apprentice plumber. And that was when I was 18 years old. Started out there. And, uh, of course, I've been working at the trade with my father uh, well before that for a couple of years during school and so forth. So I was pretty well acquainted with the plumbing industry, at least to get started. So I had uh, I'm supposed to go five years to, uh, to apprentice school. I only did two years. And that was remarkable to start with, but I, I was pretty well advanced. So I got my uh, journeyman's license at 21 and I got my master's license at 23. Uh, and I, I worked with my dad for, for a while there, but uh, when I was 27, I went into business for myself as a plumbing contractor. And uh, I worked at that for until 1980, right around 1980, maybe 79 or 80. And uh, then I developed some products in my mind that I thought would work in the plumbing industry that uh, was new, never thought of before. And of course, I thought it was the most wonderful idea that anybody ever had in their life, but I didn't know what to do with it. But uh, so anyway, I looked around for some people that could help me with my new invention. And I, the invention was made out of PVC plastics. So I thought, well, I'll have to go to a company that uh, injection molds PVC and PVC pipe injection, uh, making the pipe and fittings, which I did. I found a company, by the way, I started in Detroit. Where did you start? Really? What? Detroit. What? The Detroit. Michigan wow. Mafia. You're kidding. Oh, boy, Alan. How about that, buddy? <laughs> hey, KG, where are you from? That's when the Detroit. Thank you. <laughs> oh wow, three on one. That is you the just Mecca. Love surprises, don't you? Guys? I do. Yeah. That's when the Detroit Lions were champions and the Detroit Tigers were champions too. So I, I lived through that pretty good. So was when long you time. when you were talking about PVC in today's world in 2022, PVC is everywhere. If you're in the trade whatsoever, everybody knows plumbing, even contracting. We know what PVC is. Even if I'm a DIY homeowner, I even know I go to the, get PVC, but when you were doing this, what year was it? It was PVC a real name that a lot of people knew about and things, was it really prevalent? Well, they, they did in the housing market, but outside of that, no. It's all uh, cast iron or, or actually copper was a big thing at that time too, copper drainage. So anyway, uh, it, it was so what I was uh, inventing was not necessarily for, for PVC jobs. Uh, this was a sleeving system that you could you could run PVC through, you could run copper through, you could run cast iron through. So it didn't matter to me, but it was a unique way of doing that. 
And that was normally you would just put a sleeve in a concrete form before it's poured. And you put so the both, concrete around it. So this for, for us listening on the, on the podcast, this would be not in homes or residential. This is going to be in high-rise commercial or commercial. Multi-story buildings. So PVC was not a word used in commercial at that time. That was a big no-no. That's correct. So Chris, what, what, what Ken did was they just made a hole in the floor. And no one, you know, you have to make a hole in the floor to go to the next level. So everyone never even thought about it. So he thought that, hey, make the hole work for you, either pipe to it or through it. So instead of set a sleeve and create a hole, set a sleeve and leave it there. Oh, and leave it, not to use it as a form and leave it for just a hole, but leave it. Leave it as part of the piping system. As part of the piping system, leave it there. And so the benefit there would be that your, your plumber could do the job quicker. Or what's the benefit to that? Well, there's a lot of benefits to it because you can pipe to it from the bottom and to the top. And by the, when you're done, you're absolutely completely waterproof, smokeproof, fireproof, all at the same time. Nobody else can do that. In fact, at that time, they just had a hole in the floor. And when they ran their pipes through it, they may stick a little uh, newspapers actually around that area. So it, <laughs> that, they call that kindling. That's what you <laughs> So is that fireproof? <laughs> uh, to to <laughs> add a little, a little, add a little gas around it too. Yeah. <laughs> and then hit it with a blowtorch. Yeah. Although I had a few inventions before that, but this was kind of the, the the biggest one that I had, where I wanted to get help from outside to kick kick the thing off. So as you're working on this, you're a plumbing contractor. How long have you been a plumbing contractor? Well, since point? the time I was 27 years old to uh, uh, what would be 1980, uh, that'd be 47 years. So you were a plumbing you were a plumbing contractor right. for since, since 27. Just say a long uh, time. It was a long time. So did you have a family? Yes. So you had a family, and your primary job was going out there and plumbing each and every day. Did you have guys working for you and had built up a pretty good sized business? Yes, I did. I had a good sized business. Uh, you had over 50 people, Oregon. Whoa, 50 people. Did you hear that, everybody? 50 yeah. people. I think that's what we call a big size business. Yeah. We still are classified small business, but that's 50. That's still small business. Yeah. So, but you said, okay, I'm going to go do this. So you were thinking this idea that you had, this is going to be a side hustle. It's going to be something I just can do on the side and play around with and see if yes. it goes anywhere. Yes. So you're shaking your head. No. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you got it. You got out of that business and went into the inventing business, or decided to, you know, pursue your thoughts and ideas after you kind of got out. I mean, so, you always had these, but you made that transition, having your own plumbing business, to I'm going to go and pedal my no, stuff. What I thought I would do is. Uh, get a company that would sell my product and I would get a royalty for this. Oh, so have that have that money working for you while you're off running yeah. your 50 person company. I'm going to do this thing on the side for marketing these, these products. It was a plumbing contract. Yeah. So my thought was just to, to keep my products coming out there and just getting a royalty for them. So you developed the product. You, you found somebody clearly. I found <laughs> because, somebody. Yeah. Because we're here talking about uh, this product. Kalamazoo, Michigan. Name of the company was I don't really mention Permafit, but yeah, uh, Permafit. That's the name, of the name of the company. Are they still around today? Permafit? No, Colonial might be down. In no, they're neither one. Not. Anyway, ah, we got less. Let's keep going. Got, got a lot of I know that's sixty-five years of being in business, people. I can't stress that one enough. All right, yeah. so you get this company and they start making this product. Yes, and. The agreement was you'd go back Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, because it's plumbing and this is contracting. You're running your plumbing business and you're working on this on the side. I'm, was it, was I'm, it starting I'm to come it, I'm doing it. I call it on the side, but it, it ended up I was doing a lot of work with them, for them. And, uh, and they would pay me uh, uh, a fee to, to do whatever they wanted me to do, which I went through for a period of time. Um, it probably was six months to nine months. Uh, I could tell that uh, it wasn't working out very well because they were horrible as far as marketing what I what I had to sell. True, they made fittings and so forth, but that's a whole different marketing process. So you, which, you just you actually hit on something. 
talked about before. You're a plumber. You, you even said, I'm going to go with somebody who's better at marketing than me. And even you could sniff it, smell it, and look at it and go, uh, you're not doing this right. Absolutely. This sucks. You're gone. Yes. How about that? Sometimes you just got to follow your gut on that one. And a lot of times we're trusting people, especially in this digital world today. Well, I'm going to get your website to number one. I'm going to get you guys to number one. But back to that. So you, you sniffed it out. You saw it. Then what happened? Well, I didn't know any better. I thought that they, I didn't look outside the box of what they were doing. I just thought they had sales reps. They made products that they sold to wholesalers. And I thought certainly they knew how to market something that was kind of extra special. And uh, they, could, they could take and run with it. So it happens that they couldn't run with it. And uh, they were upset about paying me for one thing. And they're upset about royalties and all this sort of thing, uh, but they weren't doing a job. So they were unhappy, I was unhappy. So I, I split with them and we made a deal um, that uh, I knew I had to have an improvement with this fitting by the way that I had. I need to knew very well that the fitting was not exactly the way I wanted it. And that's very, uh, it regularly happens. You never have a product that stays the same. I never, I have never had a new invention that stayed the same through the years. Huh. It always changes. And it, and it does because business always changes. Everything changes just about every week, every month, and you have to stay with it. So anyway, I knew this before I left the company. So I was going to leave them with my product, knowing in my mind that that product was <laughs> Not going to be very good by the time I brought out my new one. So I did, I, I signed an agreement as a non uh, exclusive type of agreement with them. They agreed to it because it, it was not a big deal one way or another to them, really, because it really wasn't their, their uh, idea of success running. So going business. into this partnership, working with this company, you signed a non exclusive. Yes. Okay, so me, meaning for everybody out there maybe doesn't understand this, means that you, if you decide to split, you can do whatever you want. That's I can correct. go start up uh, my neck. I can bring out the same widget to be right against you. And that was my whole idea when I did it. Hmm. Um, and of course, they didn't, it didn't bother them very much because I don't think they thought I was going to do anything. But they had my product. Right. That, uh, They're like, go ahead, bring it on, yeah, little guy. You think you got this plumbing contractor? I don't think so. We're so, smarter than you. Yeah. Sure. Huh. So I don't know how far you want me to go along with the process. Well, so uh, that's we, right. You came in, came in the fold then too. You, you came in the fold or yeah. you were born? I was born. <laughs> <laughs> so when he decided to bring it back and compete or, or basically start this, still running a 50 person plumbing company in Detroit, Michigan? Uh, no. Uh, in 1980, it, it, I had a lot of work in. You know, through the 70s, 70s, through the through the late 70s, I had a lot of work going and then tailed off in the end. I don't know whether you went around in 1980, I guess. Uh, I know you were around, but I was, uh, I was barely around. Uh, I was around, but, was but not when you're not a, working, you don't know. It was very slow period in construction in 1980. That was the high interest rates, the ones that people that's are thinking when I, high interest rates. That's when I way. wanted to go and move to different territory. And I did. So did you, uh, so I want to, the thing I really want to understand is uh, before we go on to the products and, and the, the great success you've had, did you shut down your plumbing company? Did you sell it to somebody? Did you have what you could consider an exit strategy where you went, yay, I'm dancing in the end zone and I, I sold this thing for a minute. I'm going to go make product. No, um, I had my own uh, shop, office, warehouse uh, for the plumbing business. And at that time, when your business goes down, you just lay off people and kind of wait for bid jobs and so forth, trying to build it back up. In the meantime, I was involved with the, the, the inventions type of thing. So that kind of backed off in me being excited about going out and, and bidding on big jobs that I'd be right back in where I started. And I thought to myself, I can make a living off of these things because there were a number of things in my mind that I could come up with. So that was my start. Didn't, and didn't, you, had, didn't you have a couple of job, big jobs that didn't pay? And it kind of, yeah, I had you three, know, kind of written on the wall. 
that it was done. I had three huge jobs that uh, it was a pay thing that I remember I did a nursing home in downtown Detroit. And it was through a church that sponsored it. And they didn't. Pay. And uh, it, it was okay until we got to the end and uh, found out that the, the pastor, he was the guy that was handing out all the checks. He, he disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Pastor Johnson. I don't know if you his name. Ah, uh, Pastor Johnson. And then I had another one that was kind of the same thing with a guy uh, in, a, in a big uh, hall that he, he had, up, you know, headed up for, uh, you know, eating food and banquets and all that sort of thing. It's a big job, too. He didn't pay me anything. I mean, it, it went crazy. And of course, he wanted us to work seven days a week at this thing because he wanted to open up on a certain time. Well, anyway, I didn't want to get into that. No, that's, 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 that's part of it. I love, but that is part of it. So, at that point in your life, you 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 got uh, you got a family. Yeah, you had a plumbing business doing well. But in the '80s, a lot of us don't remember it, and, yeah. and I, I can't tell you I can. But I know a lot of people today with the rising interest rates up to six percent, like, oh my God, these are the highest they've ever been. I'm like, eh, you might want to time out that tiger <laughs> because uh, somebody somebody who's been around the 70s and 80s will tell you a different story. But so you so you basically wrote it on down. Uh, the plumbing company kind of just kept whittling it down and doing this. Right. But you said, I've got this great idea. I'm betting on myself. I'm going to go do this. Right. And you did this at uh, obviously you got a family to feed. You got to do all this stuff. So. How did you transition and close down the plumbing business and start up a product manufacturing business? Well, I didn't start it up at that time. Um, I, I, uh, how, how we ended up in Atlanta was uh, we had we had the little conventions that they had they showed they showed products and this was uh, like a plumbing engineers convention ASPE they call it American Society of Plumbing Engineers yeah ASPE in Boston. Yeah, yeah and this um, Ooh, rep we'll be company, tagging after. new sponsor. Rep, rep company came around my booth and was very, very interested in, in my products. So uh, they, they're from Atlanta and invited, invited me to come to Atlanta and talked about joining with them. Uh, they were selling uh, plumbing goods. They were in the, in the business. So that would have been, oh, I hate that they're in the business of selling all kinds of plumbing goods. They should be able to fit mine in, in with their, what they're doing. And one of their big lines was uh, pumps and booster pumps and everything that would go in high rise buildings. That's what I was interested in. I thought, hey, this is a good, good marriage. It's like a complimentary product. It's right. going to work well. They're selling to the same people. You're like, so you're at this trade show and they came up to you at your booth. Yeah, right. And they saw my products and they liked them. And I, we went there to meet with them and uh, had a great, great people. I thought these people were really good, so forth. We wanted to make a deal. And they said, well, we have to have an exclusive deal. I said, well, we can't do that. I said, well, why can't you do it? I said, well, I've already signed a non-exclusive deal with somebody else. So I can't do it with you, but I'm willing to sign a non-exclusive deal with you, which is the best thing I ever did. So you signed another non-exclusive. There's another non-exclusive. Gold number number two, right? Yeah. He just leveraged a non-exclusive that really he had signed, uh, and then and used it again to keep his business going uh, and and keep his product and his intellectual property. Fortunately, the first business really didn't care that much if it was exclusive or non-exclusive. This company did. They wanted exclusive. I said, I can't do that. But yeah, they, but you, get, you, you use the leverage of doing it before, and they went, well, it, so clearly they thought this was a good product. Yeah, they thought it was good enough that they did sign that non exclusive. So they said, come on down to Atlanta. <laughs> so you picked up your family and moved yeah, to Atlanta. 1983. In 1983. 1983. Well, it's 82 for me. Yeah. And so, so in 83, came. yeah. So your, your kids at that point, uh, one of them sitting here uh, in the studio with us, yeah. uh, your kids at that point were grown out of the house. Yeah. And you're rolling down. So you said, okay. Okay, boys, let's go. We're going. And so here we go. Back up the way, put everything in. Beverly Hillbillies came on, flying down from Detroit to Atlanta. Yeah. So you came down here and had you sold any product, had any product been put in any high rises at this point? Yeah. And we did with the permit. So you had, so you had yeah. products in the field, product going. Well, I sold. 
I mean, uh, they didn't sell anything. And they had, I forget how many reps they had. They had maybe 25, 30 reps around the country. Was there a lot of pushback at first? I mean, I can't imagine when you bring a, a new product like that to the market where people probably are used to doing the same thing the same way for a lot of years. And they're like, oh, I'm good with the whole of the newspaper. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So what did you what did you have to do to get that? No, and nobody wants to be. Well, it's first, funny how you know? things work out. But there came a time. Every here's here's what their excuse was. I, my guys can't set this thing that you want and stay in there at the pipe tube. They wouldn't be able to put it in the right place. So, well, what, how do you do it now? Well, we got a big. If, if like for an example, if you had a three inch line, you don't put a three inch sleeve in. You put a four in, okay? And if you didn't have the four, you put a six. If you didn't have a six, you put an eight. Didn't matter what, they just grab it if they ran out of stick. So anyway, they claim you got a lot of room in here. If they're a little off a few inches, they're good. So my, my deal didn't appeal to them because they said they can't set this thing on the exact place you need to set it. That was their big deal. So how'd you overcome that objection? Well, I didn't, but the industry did. It came out with post-tension cores. And those were the, the new post-tension cables that are in the cores. If you set a sleeve in the wrong place, you can't drill another hole. You can't use a chop saw or a hammer drill or anything else to move it. You had to set it and make sure it was where it goes. That's me. Huh. And this was the greatest thing that ever happened. So the so industry helped you start to sell your product more. Yeah, you guys are in Atlanta. You're moving the product. Things are starting to pick up. You have this one product at this point, and I just one. And you had the patent on that one at that point. Yes, I did. At that one, so you had one patent, one product, and you're like, we're going to keep riding this sucker. No, I had different products. Yeah. So just plumbing openings. There's various. You know, there's there's uh, water lines. There's stacks. There's yeah fixture openings. So you know, it's a whole set All right. of openings. 82, 83, we moved to Atlanta. We come in, with, are we living off uh, what we're making at this company or are we yeah. living off what we had saved? Well, no, we're making. We're, we're making money. Making. Right away. Well, that's awesome. Right on. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not talk about the trust of toolbox story. Yeah, boy. Yeah, but it wasn't mine. It was the company I went with supplied the money. So and you, you went with another uh, company and they paid you. Yeah, they like, gave me the royalty, plus paid me for my time, so kind of like the other company. Only this time I was more involved. And we, I, I always said, my, my product was so good, if I went out to a company, if they had a job, a multi-story job, they had to be high right, four-story, three-story, and I'm up. If they had a job and I went in and sold them, I would sell 95% of the people I saw, which is fantastic, great, really. Well, great. But I was the only one that could do that. By the way, the all first, these other guys. first job that we did was the Ritz-Carlton and Buckhead. Uh, Ritz-Carlton and Buckhead, did yeah, you hear that well, worst? But actually, did you hear that? <laughs> what got me down here was the Marriott Marquis. Marriott Marquis was that's another what, one. That's what got me down here. Which I stayed at when I had to travel here, when I was in my consulting days. When these guys told me that story, I'm like, Oh, wow. So in an odd way, I felt the kinship, right? When I first met them, <laughs> and I I'm like, you. well, how about this? My waist went right through your pipes. What? No, I don't mean it like that. Oh, God. <laughs> I can tell you how thick the floors are. <laughs> and? They're 14 inches. Because 14 we have inches. to actually cut. If you want to talk to me, I'm over here. But anyway. I can't. Uh, that's okay. They can't see but, me on the podcast but when I'm ignoring you. That's okay. Um, <laughs> but during this time, by the way, I quit college and I can ask me to we went down to Florida for a while. That's a different story. But then I had to move back in January from Fort Lauderdale, Florida to Detroit, Michigan. How about that? January. So I did. So what I did is Ken, Ken peddled the product. I made it in warehouses and we rented spaces. In Virginia, my mom paid the bills. So that's, that's so that the was a three-man crew, the three-person crew. And we're still here today. So, and we're still here today. So you, right. left, you left your drug running down in Miami. Yes. Yeah, so you came back up here and said, I'm going to peddle. I'm going to settle a different white product. I want to sell PVC. Yeah, but I thought it was cool that the first jobs were very prestigious. You know, they are. And, so you and actually, so you actually put your hands on those products that are in Marriott. 
Well, this is the yeah, biggest. So literally, we my were, waste we has gone through in, your pipes. <laughs> we were in Marriott Specs for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. not there. This right. was a brand new deal. That yeah. We had, and it was the biggest job in Atlanta. And I was in Detroit when they called me, it was an outfit out of Chicago that did that job, mechanical contractor out of Chicago. They called me when I was in Detroit to meet me on a job. And of course, in between time, I met with the people from Atlanta. So it all worked together. They were so impressed with the fact that this company wanted to use me in, in that job. And when I went down there, that's when we sealed the deal. And then after you do the Ritz and the Marriott Marquis, it's pretty easy to go to the next person and go, yeah, I just did the Ritz and the Marriott Marquis. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So the name the name recognition is starting to happen. At that point, you're starting to get in. Yeah. Or, and yeah. So was it but just you? have a lot of the guys you're talking about. And uh, uh, and we do it this way, and we don't want to mess around. We're trying to get it pinpointed right in a certain place. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we got through with that, and uh, it just rolled from there. Um, through the years, like I think I mentioned, uh, we did all the uh, all the Disney World hotels. All the major hotels used my product. Oh, boy. Did yeah. he just say Disney? Disney uh, sponsorship opportunity. <clears throat> Don't worry we about were, it. Small Business Safari, Disney. Everybody needs to know that. Disney, call me. Love the ears. So you guys did it. So was KJ the one? Was he your production department? Well, yeah, when, he, when we were in Detroit, he was <laughs> Uh, yeah, my first, so the, our very first job, by the way, was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I had to drive a steak truck that we rented on I-94 from Detroit to Kalamazoo. And it was in the wintertime. And people were beeping at me on the road. I thought, how nice they are. I'm waving to them. And I looked at my <laughs> rear through the mirror and I saw them losing half the load. <laughs> <laughs> the so I called my dad. I said, Dad. And I'm like, yeah, 20, how nice of 21 years old at the time by myself, no jacket, because that's what you do at 21 yeah. in the winter and drive a truck. Um, he said, KJ, just bring it back and we'll just redo it and just, you know, very calmly. And I did and try to gather up all the stuff. But I, I do want to say one thing. So you didn't go back through the highway dodging? Like, no, like, I, yeah, I tried, like to Frogger, tried to pick a ball up. I tried I, to pick a ball up as much as I could. Yeah. We're a bunch of those really yeah. nice Michiganders who were beeping at you. We're Actually, trying to take you out. <laughs> <laughs> Get out of my way, Ken. I, I do want to say before we go any further about kind of like the, the, the product line, what it is, you know, it replaced the hole in the floor, right? So what it did was it allowed these plumbing contractors to, to, to prefabricate their piping runs to different bathrooms, and as we all know, even if we're not plumbers, the bathroom units are the same every floor. There's only a few different styles, but that's the beauty of same measurement, same everything. And Ken's system allowed them to prefabricate these piping runs and then take them out to the job and then not deal with a hole, but deal with something they can plug it right into and the same measurements. So they're not dealing with holes in the floor. They're dealing with an actual uh, socket sockets right so, to just pop them in uh so you bring up a good point and this is where i'm interested in this one do the plumbers drive the call for these because can they tell a gc hey look this might cost you more but you need to get this stuff in i mean who buries that cost or who's the one who specs that out and says hey guys you got to use this because if my if if some sub came to me and said chris this make my life a lot easier i'm like yeah but it cost me well, more money well, to start out it was always the plumber he could see the advantage to it a lot quicker than anybody else um, because you could utilize them in a different way. You know, plug in, we had a lot of different ways of use it, using it. And uh, just the fact that the waterproofing, smoke proofing, everything else that was done uh, worked for them. They're the first ones to look at. But after that, then the professional engineer starts seeing it on a job and say, hey, what's this and so forth. And that's the way it grows. And of course, you have to really work at it to, to make it go. So I, I did a lot of traveling. I, I, actually, my oldest son, Walter, he, he was my rep in Florida. And he did a fantastic job, too. Florida was a fantastic market, still is. Uh, because of the need for high rises there. Yeah. And uh, how, how long was it after you brought this product to market before somebody tried to copy it? And Take your business from me. After my patent ran out, 
think just 19, before it did. The Patent came out in like 1979 or 80. I think maybe there were seven, 17, 17 years, right? Like so yeah, 17, 17, 17, 17 years. years, and then after 17 years, boom. We had a lot of <laughs> market <laughs> got flooded. We had market got flooded. So at that point, do you uh, you know try to establish yourself, or you've already established yourself as the original and the best and the pioneer? But they're coming in with yeah, you know, stuff made overseas that's cheaper. I mean, how how do you how did you fight that, or did you just pivot to the next product? Because apparently, from what I saw in your bio, this wasn't you're not a well. We hung on a, with a one we, hit wonder. We hung <laughs> exactly. On. We actually hung on to the same product because I thought it was still the best way to do it than they got out there today. But price did come along with it. Uh, and today they're, they're buying products for, for the cheapest. Some people don't. Some people stick with us. And I figure it's worth I could I could change. I could start making the, their product, too, because there's no nothing sacred about what they have that, that we couldn't do either but i didn't want to do that i stuck with it and I'm, i think it's a smart idea than just to copy everybody else they dumbed it down I'm not they a, made it cheaper i'm not a copier. less quality <laughs> right and they you know and they have money and they had you know they yeah. had better tanks and ammo than we did yeah but we were the original and, and ours is quality I mean, so you when when you were the production arm KJ and and, and driving uh, the product and throwing it all across Michigan and the freeways, were you guys your own company at that point, and you were using the other company as a manufacturer's rep? And oh yeah, or was this a partnership? About, we forgot about talking with the other company. When I came with the other company, I was supposed to be the technical guy to put together whatever brochures that they could use and so forth, and they were going to do the selling. The problem was they they couldn't sell. Uh, they their their reps uh, unless they're mainline people that uh, are, are can handle a lot of different lines. They're usually all in the lines that everybody buys. The wholesalers you walk in there and they got a whole bunch of them on the shelf and they sell price and available or, or they're a spec line or something like that. Right. Mine was not not none of those. So. We were between my son Walter and I. We were really doing all the selling. So I said, "Wait a minute, you know, this is one of our agreement." Was. So um, I, I split with. Them. Um, however, they spent a lot of money advertising. They flew people in. We, we had schools, and we did all this stuff. And it was very expensive. They spent the money, and I figured, well, that's their money if they want to do it this way. If I, I wouldn't have done it that way. We ended up doing it my way anyway, so all this other money they spent wasn't worth it. And I, and I told them that. But I agreed I agreed to uh, pay them back every penny that they put forth. In there. It was a lot of money, like $200,000. And this is here in Atlanta after you'd started. Yeah, actually, it was more than that. but. Yeah, he said, I'll pay you back everything. I don't know if anybody would, listening here says, hey, if you got 200 grand just sitting around, no, ready to buy something out. Dad, it was four or something. And we left and we went to Spaghetti Junction, the three of us. <laughs> well, and we yeah. hired people again yeah. to make it. We started all over again in like so, 19. So you paid him the 400 grand or whatever? No, no, no. Yeah. Over time, over, we, I think it was yeah, a five year period, but we paid him off three, is what we yeah. what happened. So you, you paid somebody to get out of a bad partnership. Yeah, I did. That's a tough decision. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a, let's face it, that's a ballsy decision, right? To, well, to pay somebody two, four, I don't care what the number is. You're paying somebody that you didn't think was doing their job, but you felt like I'm going to do this thing the right way because I, I do know you and I know you like to do things the right way. Yeah. But that's just a lot of damn money, man. How, how did, how did you say, okay, this is what I'm going to do? I've, I've had it. Because I think he believes in the product. He knew, he knew how to sell it and he knows it's good. So, that wasn't an issue. The, the big thing, it became his business. So I think the deal was, I'll pay you everything back. And if, if I can't do it, um, you guys buy the company for a buck and we go our separate ways. But if I can do it, I buy it for a buck and we go our separate ways. How about that second time that we just heard a great negotiation line? Um, if I can't do it, I'll buy it. And you can buy my business back for a buck. You get it all back. Everything you ever spent, plus I paid you back. And if I can do it, you get it for a buck. 
So if I'm on the other side, I'm like, all right, so I just get to recoup my loss. I didn't get a loss. I didn't make any money, but I didn't lose any money. And then I could get all this stuff back when this loser can't figure it out. (laughs) All right, I'll take that deal. And you're on the other side going, yeah, well, you guys have screwed up. You done screwed up now. And by the way, (laughs) I I tell that to a lot of people that are going through a, a bad time failing at whatever they're doing, because if we didn't fail, that would have never happened and it wouldn't have become our business. Yeah, it's still it's still a hard pill to swallow and a hard path to go on. I know you guys are looking back on it now, but you know, if, if you're in the middle of business and you're faced with that decision, and we we talked about this before we went on air. I mean, every day you're running your own business, we're solving problems. That's not a problem. That's can, what's the I, give me a bigger word. Big problem. Big problem. I mean, wow. I mean, this is a tough call. So you had to make that call and you had the resources where you said, I'll pay them off over time. Then you had to go find your own facility and you had to start making your own product right. and tell Walter and yourself, boys, put your sales shoes on because we got to sell a lot more. Yeah. Wow. So you did that. You, you guys started taking off. Had you started to see the momentum? You started selling it your way. Yeah. Well, I knew at that time I could do it. I, I, I wouldn't have done it if I didn't think so. I mean, it would not. Well, I don't, all, I don't all want to, I didn't want to sell really everything for a buck and give them my patents on yeah. top of it. That was another thing that threw it. Right. And you, oh, wow. Sweeten the pot a little bit. Yeah. That's how much you bet on yourself. We talk about that, that a lot of this podcast yeah. is that when you go into small business, um, who do you want to bet on? You want to bet, let somebody else bet on you or do you want to bet on yourself? Yeah. And when you go to your, run your own business and you're betting on yourself and it's fun and scary all at the same time. So you guys go off, you start doing this, you start selling product. And this is the product we're selling at this point is the, the penetration selling as the plumbers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, penetration business. Big was, market. Big, was right now I had a two person sales force and a one person manufacturing arm sitting over yeah. to my right. What, what were you guys thinking at that point? And uh, did you guys really start thinking about scaling? Is this one of those things where you were the dog trying to catch the car and you're like, oh my God, if I caught the car, now what? Like if I just all of a sudden got 45 jobs in a row or what were you guys thinking at that point? Well, we think we could, we could get that, do that, and we could make a lot of money. Uh, and I, I just want to go back to as far as people wondering how I was so clever to do all these things that I did that turned out really good for us. Because I was also in plumbing business for many years, and I learned how to handle a lot of business things that unfortunately a lot of people wouldn't have that experience like the way I had going through. So I knew some of the tricks of the trade uh, from, from my plumbing contracting business. So, you okay? I'm checking. Uh, so uh, one of the things I love to do, and I just threw you off, I'm sorry, but I just yeah. couldn't help myself because I like to go Facebook Live when we're doing our podcast. And this episode is going to get published, but I just wanted to see if the third person was actually watching, and she is. <laughs> so hi virginia i hope you're enjoying it so yes we're gonna keep going all right so that's yeah. what i was doing i was waiting for her to join i saw she just joined now i'm really pumped up right. so, a lot of people have great ideas but they never do anything with it. And so i'm really impressed with the fact that whatever was going on in your life you had this idea and you were so committed to it um, you were a plumber by trade you don't know anything about the patent process you know right. you got to get yourself a lawyer you got to figure you know that's a big thing yeah can you spend a few minutes and now how many patents do you have now uh 50 and i have four working right so they're kind of like potato chips i guess you know you eat the yeah. first one and then next thing you know you do the whole bag but uh, um, can, can i just eat one yes yeah, no i, I want mean, one I just once want you, one once my life. that process once then, then it's I, I have patent envy but i'm not gonna lie yeah i have patent envy well, in, 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 in fairness to the patents, they're all about plumbing. I don't have one patent that's not about plumbing or piping or securing or whatever. They're all related. And that all came from my background. And that's what pushed me through this whole thing from the beginning to the end. My background in the, as a plumbing contractor. That was the, the key because I, I was superior to any of these manufacturing reps or manufacturing people, they didn't, they may manufacture a product that a plumber uses, but I'm the plumber and I could look at a product and say, that was good, this was bad. They, they did, I can't say none of them had people on, on their staff. 
that could say this is good and bad. Very few of them would hire a person like that, but some of them would. But I was a guy that knew what was good and what was bad. And when I when I patented the product, I knew it was good or I didn't patent. But that's still a pretty big process to get something patented, isn't it? Yes, it is. And it's kind of scary for a person who's never done it before. And you got to make sure you get the right patent attorney. That's very important. I want, I want to say something, though. My dad is unique in an industry that goes by the book. And there are a lot of industries like that. So he invented some stuff that's like, this is way better than you guys are doing it. And it seems like the industry is so slow. And there's not many guys like him at all in this industry that are creating new ways to do old things that no one thinks about changing because guess what you got to go by the book it says here in the code book you can't do that ken and he would say well this is better <laughs> and he has changed many many codes yeah. it's it's obviously a rare, rare person and amazing and that's why i'm so glad you're on the podcast a lot of us don't have that mindset that, that mentality to think out of the box right we've heard of that such a trite phrase but kj you said it better than i did is that the plumbing is a very slow to move industry because they also All feel the, the weight of safety. Yeah, electrical, yeah. construction, you know, I, I got my GC license. The reason we, we still think wood is the absolute bomb is because wood's been around a lot longer than us. And that's why we think it's gonna hold the houses up a lot better than anything else out there. Right. I don't wanna hear about this new thing, concrete or this new sacri. I, I know wood works. So that's, it's hard. And it's hard to break that mold and think out of the box and do this. And so, for those of us who haven't gotten the patent, you've just thought about it 54 times and <laughs> went through the patent gauntlet, which Alan, uh, you, you answered the question, yes, it is hard to get that. But that doesn't even begin to answer how hard it is to get a patent because it's the uniqueness, it's the idea, it's the attorney. You have to make checking. sure nobody has done something similar before. I don't even know what the process is to research that. But. I'll tell you an interesting thing about patents. Do you think you get something really unique? And you do a patent search on it, say, oh, 1913, the same thing a guy had. <laughs> you, can't, you can't use this because it's exposed art uh, and, and it's there and it's what you've invented, right? So, it, boom, you don't get a patent. And it's crazy because it's just the way the law reads and it's hard to get a patent because you can imagine all these years. At one time, they thought there could not be any more patents there. there all the ideas were they already out there, which was the biggest joke of the century. Right. But that's the way it was. And when you see something that was invented in 1940 or 1913 or whatever it was, that's your product out there. It may not be exactly, but it shows enough that you didn't think of. And yet you did. That's kind of hard. Care hit on one thing that I love that, uh, that people think, and we all think that because we're stuck sometimes in our own mindset, is that well, everything's been invented. I can't come up with anything new. So this is impossible. Yeah. I can't do that. Wrong, right? That's right. the, as you said, the biggest joke of the century. If you've got a great idea, then pursue it. Go figure it out. Do it the right way. Yeah, it's a lot of work, but if it was easy, anybody could have done it. So good luck for you if you want to go out and try it. Go get it. Go make it happen. Go do that. Because not every great idea has been thought about already. And I think that, that, that that's just so key. But I want to get back to uh, the fun of running your own business. So you've got this product, you've got, he's not a one man band in the product shop anymore because you guys started to sell and get things going. So you had to start scaling. Right. So who scaled the operations? How did you scale the operations? How did you scale it? How did you start to scale that business uh, to get to today? How many employees do you have today? Well, we have over 50. We have, we have a in injection molding plant up in South Carolina, plus the place we have here in Atlanta. That's another great story. So injection molding place in Atlanta. We're uh, making how many different products out of this, these uh, areas now? I don't know. We got to count them. <laughs> yeah, so many. So you know, and and what we do more than one. I tell people, <laughs> no, no. It's seriously, it's like Lego blocks. You remember yeah. Lego blocks? And I tell people this today. I said our stuff is like Lego blocks. You really can make anything out of it because the parts and pieces go together to to handle whatever the issues are out in the field. And they change with construction types and and and, and fire rating, hourly ratings, oh, what you got to have. There's a you got a core drill a hole, and then on top of that is laminate, and then on top of that is is cord concrete. And it's like, what? But yet, 
we can do it. Our hardest part now is calling it something and putting it in the computer. But we can make it. That's the easy part. So you ran out of names. No, well, no, but we got to name it something. Now we just call it fab, fab, fabrication for, like, we can make it specifically for your job. Okay. And your job. I think Alan's, be, Alan's angry, really. Let's get honest. Alan's angry. Can you name a product after him, please? Yeah, yeah or, absolutely. Or like you can. Yes, director of new names. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the title you want? Yeah, so you get the piece of this? Absolutely. Yeah. But I will uh, say this too. We not many come people. to work for us because. We don't know. We can't think of the name. <laughs> we need a name caller. We need. A, I'm the official name caller from yeah. it's it's like the horses so at the Kentucky Derby. Their names just get longer and longer and longer over the years. Yeah. <laughs> the trouble with Ken is he does everything right, and so he starts to name these things, and it's like, Dad, no, we'll do it. <laughs> you know, but you don't have to do that. But he's into everything, and he'll name stuff. And Dad, we already have that in the system. We made that already or whatever but it's fun and i was going to say not many people i mean he loves it so much he's still doing it and he's still got four future patents in the till um and he there aren't too many mom and pop run places that still after mom, all these i love how you called it mom and pop run here. places because truly this one is a mom yeah. and pop run place Dad's here. Mom's watching here on Facebook Live. Son's sitting to the right of us. But <laughs> when we talk about mom and pop, let's let's just get real, people. Uh, we're talking about like Jeff Bezos style mom and pop. These guys have killed it. They've done a great job. So you said the uh, South Carolina plant was a good story. Yeah, because I got a, I got a call one day from my dad saying, "Hey, uh, the the guy that ran the plant that and they ran parts for us. His name was Nim Renfro from South Carolina, and uh, Nim died." And his son was probably incapable of running the place. And eventually it kind of, they went out of business and they were running our parts. And we had all our molds there. And uh, I got a call from my dad. He said, KJ says, I think I could buy this place for a really good deal. It's just me and the bank. But I don't want to buy a business that I don't know anything about. So I said, no, do it. He says, but I don't know who can run it. And I said, I do. So it's a great story. There's a husband and wife that used to make products for us back in Alabama that got married in the warehouse. <laughs> and they flipped the coin, unbeknownst to us, to accept the job to run the ProSet Plastics in Spartanburg, South Carolina. And they've done it for years, but it's allowed my dad to let his mind go now and to tinker and to make things because we have an ejection molding plant that can make it. So it, it kind of, you know, another another thing happened in our business. So since he bought the plant, I don't know how many new products you've come up with, but a lot. And some are just no brainers. Uh, the one we make now, they only made it cast iron and we own a plastics plant and everyone's running PVC pipe to this fitting. Ken says, um, <clears throat> I think it's time to make that thing out of plastic. We do. So you're running everything in the cast iron. So you sort of making that fitting. Yeah. So there, there's a there's a fitting that my brother sells. Wally uh, sells. It's a cast iron fitting. Only two people make it in the United States, and it self vents itself, which means you eliminate all the vent piping and everything that goes along with it, hangers and couplings and the penetrations for it. So it, it, it's very valuable. So th they fought all the battles and everything else. And it got acceptance over the years. And Ken's on it all the time. Just like I'm looking at the fantasy football magazines, he's looking at all the trade magazines, like all the time. When I look in his office, he's in there looking. He's on it. So he says, you know what? All these people are hanging PVC pipe from these cast iron fittings. I think people's thoughts are, why don't they make that thing out of PVC? And he did. Yes, well, getting, I... Speeding back to your podcast, Chris. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to bring out a point that probably once every week or every two weeks, somebody calls me and says, I got an idea. And I know that you got all kinds of ideas. And I was wondering if you mind helping me with my idea. And I'll tell them, no, I'd love to hear people's ideas and I'd love to help you if I can. And so they, 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 they're lost. They think they got the greatest invention in the world, and, and maybe they do, but they don't know what to do, what the next step is. And 
I try to explain the best I can, but they are truly lost in what to do. They don't have any money. They don't, uh, they don't know where to go to say, hey, this is a great product or whatever it is. And I explained to them, that's what you want to find out first. Don't be afraid to talk to other people about it. Just have them sign a non, you know, disclosure agreement. And it'll help you because people like to help people, other people. And so I try to get them to get moving, at least on, on what their idea is, to get it somewhere where it will work and do what they expect it to do. It's very difficult. Um, but which part you, is very difficult? you can do it. Which part is the difficult the part? part to what, what should I do? They're always afraid somebody's going to steal their invention, you know. And, but you got to get over that because if you're going to do anything, you have to do what you have to do, even if you lose, it, even if somebody steals it from you. Right. You still got to go through these steps to get it to where you want it. And try to deal with people that are going to help you and not hurt you, you know. Right. Uh, so that's another trick. But anyway, it can be done. So anybody who's listening is, is thinking about something like that. You've got to pursue it to a point where you've done your best job in getting where you want to go. Because that's what they really want to do. But they don't uh, They don't have the wherewithal to do it. This, uh, uh, there are so many more areas I want to keep going. Um, but I want to also know that our audience, we're used to a 45, 50 minute podcast. Kara just dropped another great one. You can do this and people want to help you. We've talked about this before. People come to me and say, Chris, I, uh, I have a handyman business. Can I come talk to you? Sure. And I flip my QuickBooks around and go, there you go. You show them everything. I'm like, yeah, I sure am. You know why? This is a really hard freaking business, bro. Good luck. So to your point, people are willing to help you. And if you think people are going to steal from you, Man, that's such that corporate mentality that I had to get away from. That, you know, share, talk to the right people. Have them sign the NDA. That's going to keep you protected. And frankly, it's just a piece of paper. You got to know if this person is a good person or not. Because if you came to me and said, man, I have this great idea. Frankly, I don't have enough time to go figure out how to steal this one anyway, because I got too many other things I want to do anyway. And even if I think I'm going to steal it, I'm going to do that for like five minutes. And the next five minutes, I'm going to go over with fantasy football trying to figure out how to be KJ. So... so there is so much more I want to talk about, but right. I just wondered if we could maybe get you guys back for just another episode and maybe you guys come back. We could talk about how you've grown from, because we talked about one product that's turned into 54 different products or actually unnamed products, how you scaled and how you guys went through that. Would you guys be willing to come back? Yeah. Great. Well, before we let you guys go, how can everybody on the podcast get a hold of you, find out more about your stuff, or maybe they said, oh my God, I got to family member in the contracting business, or I'm a contractor, I'm in this business, I got to get this product or I got to get hooked up with these guys. How can they find you? You can find us at our website, proventsystems.com. Uh, oh, phone numbers there. Yeah, phone numbers are all there. All the contact info is there. Um, and by the way, we, we've talk, he's talked about the, the history, the whole thing. And all that. I got to tell you, we've had the best, we've been blessed with the best people to work for us. I don't, that, that's another lucky thing that, you, you know, it just happens. The people we have hardly have any turnover with people. Um, the plastics plant in South Carolina, though, they they uh, take over. How many people do you want to read this year, Chris? And on that note, everybody, that was a great episode. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have done a great job. And yes, I, I uh, knowing you guys personally and the culture you've built in your company has been amazing. I, I continue to talk about culture and how it's important it is. Uh, yes, in my business, I have a very transient workforce. That's a nice way of putting it. Yes, I've lost a lot of people. Thank you, Alan, for bringing that up. Just wanted to point out the distinction there. Thank you. Well, it's it's right. uh, it's been a blessing to us. All right. That. Well, we're bringing you guys back. If you like this episode, go out there, follow us. Small Business Safari. You can find us at the safaripodcast.com. You can go out there, rate, review, follow us, please. I just need more listeners. I want to hear from you guys. This is Chris and Alan saying we got to go. Cheers. <laughs>